and welcome to Painter by Quarterly Slush Pile. We take more time than other editorial boards, but we stand behind our methodology, so much so that we're going to share our process with you through this podcast. Welcome to the editorial table. Well, we're not in our sound studio. We're in a cinder block meeting room on the fifth floor of uh, the building in which my office is. And um, we're, uh, I'm so happy to say that I still have Marion Wren on, on my left. And um, it's hard not to keep a hand on her all the time and keep her here with us. So happy to have my co-editor here. Um, so I'm Kathleen Volk Miller and I direct the publishing program here at Drexel and the Drexel Publishing Group, co-editor of the Painted Bread Quarterly, uh, write memoir and creative nonfiction, and I'm happy to be here and ready to podcast. Podcast! This is Mary. Podcast. podcast. <laughs> and I am co-editor of the Painted Bread Quarterly and thrilled to be groping distance from Kathleen. <laughs> um, I write uh, creative nonfiction essays and I do some research into journalist training programs during the Cold War some sketchy stuff there. Um, and I run the uh, writing program for NYU Abu Dhabi, and I'm thrilled to pieces to be in Philly, and I'm bouncing the microphone to Tim Fitz. <laughs> My name is Tim Fitz, and I've been reading with the Panda Bride Quarterly for three years, and I am a short story writer. I'm Caitlin McLaughlin, sitting here next to Tim Fitz. I am the digital communications co-op for Drexel Publishing Group. I've been reading with PBQ for about nine months, and I'm an English major here at Drexel University. And I am Jason Schneiderman. I am associate editor at Painted Bride Quarterly. I am coming to you from my lovely yellow Parsons table mm -hmm. in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn. And it falls to me to introduce our very special guest editor, Erica Meitner. Um, Erica Meitner Ooh. is the author of Four Books of Poetry, <laughs> the winner of the National Poetry Series. And um, she's actually, she's a professor at, the, at Virginia Tech. And she has actually just come back from the Republican National Convention where Virginia Quarterly Review actually sent her out to do a documentary poetry project. So Erica, welcome. Thank you. I'm coming to you from my home office in rural Southwest Virginia, where I can see the mountains and the rain through my window. Nice. Is it raining there? It's pouring. Oh. <laughs> so how was Cleveland? It was great. It was weird. Um, the So Virginia Quarterly Review sent me there with a photographer named Ryan Spencer Reed, um, who um, has done a bunch of different projects in conflict zones like um, South Sudan and um, he's been embedded with a marine unit and so we went to the Republican National Convention um, and we worked together on a similar project in Detroit uh, years ago in 2010 but it was actually pretty calm you know we were prepared for real riots and it was not that um, so it was pretty heavily militarized. Um, I have about two weeks to write up all my poems for Cleveland, so I'm <laughs> jamming through a lot of audio transcription and photos to try to do it. Wow. Is it easier to turn this, turn your experience into poetry than, than prose, than a, than a, you know, reportage, or what um, is that like? Yeah, for me it is. I think this is the first time I've ever worked on such a tight deadline. I had months and months for the Detroit project. And so in that way, the turnaround is pretty journalistic. Although for journalists, I have really long lead time, you know, having yeah. is incredible lead time. But for poets, it's a very quick turnaround. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'll, I'll let you know how it turns out. <laughs> Yeah. I was just going to say, let us know where this, where and when this appears, and we'll put a, um, a blurb up on, on our page as well, yeah, so that uh, we can link our readers over. Absolutely. Great. Okay. I definitely will. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. We have three poems to discuss today, all by uh, the same poet, Maureen Seaton, and um, we're going to jump right in and start reading and discussing those. Our, our loyal listeners know, but for newbies, you can go to pbq.drexel.edu and see these poems in case you would like to read along or read ahead of time or just read. Mm -hmm. Go to pbq.drexel.edu and you can find these. So first up is West 
So, who would like to take it on? I will read it. This is Marion, and this is called West Ho, Maureen Seaton. Colorado ties with Texas for sixth sunniest state in the USA. Who cares? The sun's not racing against itself. Why should it? I will not be buried in Elizabeth Port, nor one of the oranges, like the rest of my clan. My body will not be flown, ho flown home in a crate to be clucked over by who knows which Irish relatives. The way the sun rises here, clanging its huge cowbell, easing the east right out of you. You'd think everybody'd be tinted silt and rouge and worshiping the bright solar prince of the solar palace. Who? I'm but one who recently drifted from old New Jersey, the 27th sunniest state, where the sun shines 56% of the time. Don't underestimate the operatic trill and maw of this western sun as it blazes over you and laughs behind the Rockies. Mm -hmm. It will draw you to it and sear you like a steak. Jersey girl, golden Guernsey, little pail of milk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Wow, I feel like we just went all over the country. Yeah, right? with the Jersey, right? <laughs> Like I want to, I want to double check the submission. Did she submit for locals? Because it feels so like inflected with places. I I'm fairly know. certain it was locals. Yeah, it does feel really good for locals. Yeah, I'll double check while we're talking. I love the ranking of states by sunniness. Yeah, it's yeah. so bizarre. <laughs> yeah, uh, and well, and how what percentage of the time uh, the sun is shining in a particular state. And of course, the um, departure from the East Coast to the West Coast is really satisfying. Yeah, I feel like this uh, poet got a lucky case of OCD. <laughs> you know, you know, ranking and percentage and stuff that happens probably all the time. And it happens to be an interesting type of repetitive yeah, yeah, I was thinking something similar. Like, um, I have OCD, so I mean, <laughs> for me, I, uh, is it lucky? Um, sometimes it's lucky, <laughs> but um, you know, I'll research these things and have the strangest facts that like just kind of go around in my mind. And I was really getting the same vibe from this poet. So I don't know if they have OCD, but maybe they do. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I will, I will jump in and scream this. Um, the three poems that that Maureen submitted are indeed submitted for the locals issue. Um, it's just a you know fun fact side note we're, we're reading to fill that issue. Um, so yes, back to the sunny estates. Um, yeah, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised that it sun shines 56 percent of the time. I would have guesstimated more like 70. Mm. Maybe it's just my sunny attitude. It's pretty cloudy. Optimistic <laughs> <laughs> position. I don't know. What's Virginia Virginia feel like, Erica? It's but we have we are we're in the middle of a stretch of what's supposed to be eight straight days of rain. Oh, um, right now. But normally we're actually pretty sunny. I mean, I think one of the things that's so interested it's interesting to me about this poem is it wasn't actually the facts and figures that stood out to me. It was this way the poem actually really captured the feeling of displacement you get when you go from east to west or move from east to west. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea, one of the things, I, I moved out to Santa Cruz, California for a year to teach. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was so fascinating to me was this visceral idea that people aren't supposed to suffer um, <laughs> in a particular way when you live in California, whereas on the East Coast, there's this, there's this notion that suffering is built into you because of the weather, and California has climate. And I think this poem does a really good job with that idea of displacement from your location, from the ethos of your location, from the weather, from the climate, and also familial displacement, and this idea of being other, um, and also the way it draws in mortality to give the whole poem this gravitas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And the Irish comes back at the end. Right, right, that's right. I'd love to hear you like a steak. <laughs> Jersey girl. Jersey girl, golden girls. A little pail of milk is gorgeous. Yeah. And that turn is amazing to move from steak to cows to milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, on that point too, I like the way um, Jersey emerges in the poem um, in the third stanza, right? So I will not be buried in Elizabeth Court nor one of the oranges. 
And Elizabeth Port, like I don't, I don't have a, a, a sort of, you know, I don't have the coordinates for that in my head. But one of the oranges is, you know, speaking to the oranges, right? The towns in, in Jersey, in Northern right. Jersey. And I love the way that that like rewards the reader, like who's aware of that geography. And if you're not, it's also just a delightful sort of, you know, pun for the rising sun as well, mm -hmm. right? So you have the, the sun and sunnets and then the oranges, like, you know, just sort of connecting in with the geography. So I'm, I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. I also like the use of questions, but it kind of keeps like tossing itself out, that it keeps engaging with all these facts and saying like, who? Who cares? Why is that important? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed that. that, 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 that like it sort of keeps a certain lightness, even though it's talking about mortality and where one's body gets buried. Yeah. Right. Well, it is such a great moment in there because it, it actually pokes at the seriousness of the tone there with the bright solar prints of the solar palace palace it's almost like the the speaker is saying okay i know i'm getting a little schmaltzy yeah right well you know what erica on that in the first two cares in that first stanza, i actually didn't know how to read it right like is it supposed to be like a sigh like a whatever or like a sincere like who is it that cares about this right like <laughs> and, it, and i didn't i didn't quite trust the comedy of it or the irony mm -hmm. yet right but then it the poem really does cultivate that trust as it as it flows yeah it's a really confident voice and the way that it's written mm -hmm. just moves forward so smoothly and easily it's it's really masterful i think west ho <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting it's West Ho and not Westward Ho. I know, I know. And then I have, you know, Jersey Girl, Guernsey, West Ho. Like, what's yeah. going on with that? <laughs> Getting my jersey up in here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those last lines are just terrific. Yeah, they really are. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like what you said, Jason. There is a confidence to the voice. I couldn't mm -hmm. express it. I couldn't, I didn't know what it was. And that's what it is. There's just such a, it's, it's, it's just a masterful ease. I mean, that's, that's, that's craft, right? Is when it mm -hmm. looks like you're not doing anything and you're really doing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like we are ready to vote. I do believe. I do believe. Ready to vote? Ready? Okay. So Erica, you're going to type it up and our, our wonderful sound engineer is going to tell us what you have to say. All right. But we in the studio, not the studio, we in the in the concrete room in the cinder block room cinder block room <laughs> sounds like you guys are in an insane asylum <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. well, well. Uh, academia. we could be anywhere <laughs> um, one two three shoot one two three shoot and it's a unanimous yes go on maureen Oops, just enough to bang on the table. Yeah, we're not meant to bang okay. on the table. Sorry. Sorry. Um, just so you can picture this, not only are we in a cinder block room, but we don't have our usual headphones and mics in front of us because we're not in the audio room. Instead, we are speaking into a large black ravioli. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. It's sitting in the center of the table. I'm expecting it to hover at any moment. <laughs> But there's there's like a, a large black ravioli slash hovercraft <laughs> that we're speaking wow. into. This. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, but hopefully this is all working. Um, all right. So our next poem is called West Ho Two, numeral two. Also by Maureen Seaton. Also by Maureen Seaton. Can we get a reader? I can do it. All right. Jason. West Ho Two. I also live in the state of New Mexico, the second sunniest state, and in Florida, the eighth. Mm -hmm. I live in three places, but I don't have three faces. This is not exactly a metaphor, yet I can see the metaphor coming at me, a satellite in the hard, dark sky. Deputy Azevedo placed Dector's head in an evidence bag and took it out to his cruiser. The last words I read as I fell asleep last night. Here in Colorado, everyone skis obsessively on Sunday. People break their legs and arms and sometimes their necks. I'm feeling a little Jersey today. <laughs> Don't get me talking about dogs or coffee. There are no real characters in this poem, only those who have escaped from Tottawa. Lily Tish, for example. Lily will not be buried in Tottawa, nor Newark, nor Hoboken. Her musical body will be laid to rest somewhere on the plains of Colorado. 
personally, I both do and don't believe in the efficacy of death and dying. Egg cream, potsy, stoop, stickball. <laughs> These are some of the words a Jersey girl might remember while under the influence of the Colorado sun. Her musical body will be buried in Boulder Valley under the lid of a baby grand piano, her soul accompanied into the afterlife by a flash mob of multi-generational percussionists. And I, I made an error there. I should have said Lizzie Tish, and I said Lily Tish both times. It's Lizzie Tish. Things happen. You said a lot of words really well, though. <laughs> There's a lot of words. <laughs> I'm sorry that I was uh, <laughs> laughing aloud at times. I hope that wasn't even disruptive, but um, I've lived in Jersey for a long time. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, and um, I loved here in Colorado, everyone skis obsessively <laughs> on Sunday. <laughs> It's certainly the obsessively, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's like when a Jersey person would make fun of like the Californians eating the avocados obsessively, right? Or people in Colorado skiing obsessively on Sunday. Mm -hmm. People break their legs and arms and sometimes their necks. They're great, you know. Yeah. The implications are, are just so great and funny to me. It's funny, my best friend's actually in Colorado right now, but she's from, from Pennsylvania. She said something very similar about the, the skiing. The skiing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like the illusion that these lines are continuously going through the poet's head. Even yeah. when they, they, the poet just stops to write them every once in a while. So <laughs> they've got ideas about street yeah. lights and stop signs mm -hmm. and grocery stores. Everything's compared to the place. Okay. Well, listen, I don't mean to be a stickler, and maybe I'm just, you know, uh, pushing against the kind of all over the mapness of West and West Ho 2. I loved West Ho. West Ho 2 starts us in New Mexico, and then by the third um, stanza, right? And I'm, I'm gonna call it a stanza, now we're in Colorado, right? So it was New Mexico, Florida, Colorado, and then Jersey. So does that, does that trouble anybody? Or are you loving the sort of constellation of places, the sort of the coordinates on the map that this obsessive voice is conjuring? I loved it. I think it really echoes the way that I think like my mind works often. Like we were talking about like the OCD thing. I really, I really like this, but things just kind of pop up sometimes the egg cream potsy stoop stick ball and the deputy yeah. as a Vado. Um, I love that. It echo I think it echoes the author's um, thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had some trouble. I wondered about that idea of I live in three places. It kind of dragged me away from the poem because I started wondering why the speaker lived in three places. Like what was the backstory there? Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of, it, it moved me toward a narrative that didn't end up, what the poem ended up saying to me is that this speaker is in her heart, Jersey, no matter where else you take her. Mm -hmm. um, the things that actually were, pulled me out of the poem a little bit more were some of the references. Like I was desperately Googling to try to find out more information about Lizzie Tish. Well, what did you um, find out? I found out a couple of things that there was some kind of sitcom in the 70s called The Family where Christy McNichol was often referred to by her mother as Lizzie Tish. Um, but it actually comes from a radio show from like the 30s or 40s where there was some kind of character named Tizzy Lish and that that was inverted to create some kind of nickname. But th in the poem, it seemed like an actual person, and I couldn't find anything um, on the actual person to give me like a, a hook to kind of grab onto. Was family set? Where was that? It was probably set in California. Well, was it set in New Jersey? Here's the thing. I, I didn't get, I'll just defend it to say that uh, I didn't. I'm interested in who Lizzie Tish is, but I wouldn't have stopped reading or feel like I need to know that to to give the poem value or not, because it was in keeping with the scattered mind. Like Tim started the whole conversation with these are things that are just floating through her mind, you know, and she says there are no real characters in this poem. Only those who have escaped from Totawa, Lizzie Tish, for example as a you know as a character Lizzie Tish will not be buried 
I wish I knew what her musical body means mm -hmm. because then she brings it back to herself and says this musical body. And the multi-general right. percussionist. Her musical body will be buried in Boulder Valley. Um, I think these poems are certainly good against each other. Yeah. Uh, but to answer Marion's first thing, and, and um, you spoke about this too, Erica, because those other states were dismissed so early, I wasn't really concerned, you know? <laughs> I didn't, Mexico and Florida didn't confuse me. And I don't know, there are a lot of people that live in more than one place. Maybe there's somebody sitting next to me <laughs> and, and that might live. I mean, how do you how do you identify where you live if you teach somewhere for three months and then you're in a camp for two months and then you, you know, when yeah. when does it become living there and not just staying there or yeah. visiting there? So full right? disclosure. It wasn't that confusing. Full disclosure, I'm in this cinder block room with my suitcase. Like I have a suitcase in here. <laughs> so I have to go back to New York, right? Like I'm, I'm in three places all the time, but I will say there's something about that opening stanza like that, that like, this is not exactly a metaphor yet. I can see the metaphor coming at me, a satellite in the hard, dark sky. I freaking love that. But what I don't like are the first two lines that sort of like a throat clearing gesture, which sounds a little bit harsh, but when I get to, I live in three places, but I don't have three faces. I don't, I don't, I don't know the comedy of that. Like, I don't, is that supposed to be like, what, mm, it, 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 the tone seems a little wonkadoo. And so as much as I like that first stanza, I'm, I'm out, right? And I don't want to be out because I really like the rest of the project of the piece. Huh. Oh, that wasn't so complicated for me either. I mm -hmm. thought she didn't live three different lives. Mm -hmm. She's still herself in each place. That's mm -hmm. all. I think living somewhere constitutes a combination of duration, relationship, <laughs> job, and yeah. education. So at a certain point, they add up mm -hmm. and you think, I'm living here. Mm -hmm. I just want to establish that before we go on because we started that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I I don't mind these the, the happening happening in the first, but I think because we read the poem before that, and I also think that when I start reading about this jumble of places in the sort of uh, wacky way of looking at the world, there's like a finite number of lines that I can read this type of stuff, mm -hmm. and I'm about. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could read three of the poems, but I can't read four. Like yeah, there's a certain yeah. point where it's gonna it's gonna go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I feel like one thing the poem isn't doing for me yet, and this to me I guess feels important. I love this transition. The here in Colorado, everyone skis obsessively on Sunday. To I'm feeling a little Jersey today, but I want. I kind of felt like I wanted more about what feeling a little Jersey today meant other than this idea of talking or dogs or coffee um, and cream potsy stoop and stick ball, which are all these words that evoke in some cases sort of either parodies of Long Island or New York or sometimes Jersey or very old school New York, like New York of the 40s or 30s. Um, and that was something I kind of, if, if I hadn't had the poem before it, um, I feel like this idea of like, what does it mean? For the speaker to be a Jersey girl, I'd have a lot less of an idea. With the poem before it, I have more of an idea. But with this poem alone, I still feel like it's it's maybe relying on these tag these tags a little bit. In ways um, that feel broad. Isn't I'm feeling a little Jersey today? Just sardonic about the Colorado and skiing all the time. I I. I I thought that that was you know she she disses on Coloradoans and then explains herself by saying I'm feeling a little Jersey today. She's like mocking the Coloradoans because yeah. her Jersey self is larger today. But then delivers a kind of definition in the list and then further still with the Tatawa. Like right. escaping from Tatawa is a direct reference to the state of New Jersey. So mm -hmm. it, it does both of those. It's sort of like mm -hmm. this conceptual Jersey thing, right? Right. This sort of affect. And then a very specific, like, this is what that means, right? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't linger in particulars there, right? It lingers in these sort of, like, quick references. And it distances herself from the people who ski obsessively in Colorado. That's the way I viewed it. Yeah. Do we want to think about them kind of together? Well, um, we already you know, accepted the... Um, we accepted it, West Ho. Right. Mm -hmm. So we do so. have to think about the fact that West Ho 2 would appear right next to West Ho. Um, do they play as a pair <laughs> in a but way? I feel, I feel like like the, the general, like, I mean, I, I like West Ho a lot more than West Ho 2. 
Mm-hmm. But I do like a lot of West Hope too. Um, I had this weird thing where I, Florida is not in the West. So like, I was like, Florida is mm-hmm. not in the West. Um, which doesn't, <laughs> I don't think that should be you a deal. You say right it now. just like that? But Florida what? is not the West. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah. I was being New York today. The worried <laughs> voice. I, I, I feel New York. New York. <laughs> I prefer West Hope 2 to West Hope 1. Do you really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Do you want to say why? Um, I think it's just that voice that scattered um, the italics scattered into the the poem. I like the the way West Ho Two is structured more than West Ho One as well. I like that kind of um, not exactly a block, but more like almost paragraphs. I like mm-hmm. that style better. Um, I think we get a better understanding of the voice in West Ho Two. Mm-hmm. Um, I get a picture in my mind of what the speaker is like, whereas in West Ho One, I was kind of wanting more of that. Is the flash mob of multi-generational percussionists, is that like a dig at all the annoying drum circle types? Like the, the pothead. Yeah, yeah. I didn't uh, even think that her soul comes into the, into the afterlife of flash mob. I do love, love that. Valley, right? I love, 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 love that image. And that really, you know, sort of links uh, this mysterious Lizzie Tish, right? Like I you know, or Tizzy Lish, whatever her actual name is, right? <laughs> I, I, I do, I'm so curious to know more about her, right? And what, right. what makes her body musical, But this is right? her, though, the speaker, when the speaker dies. Yeah, but her musical body will be buried in Bloody right. Valley is Tizzy Lish, Lizzie Tish. Right? Oh, no, I thought that was the Jersey girl. Under the lid of a baby grand piano, her soul company. Oh, maybe, right? There's so much Jersey girl. Yeah, you're right. Okay. <laughs> There's more that I, I question in West Ho 2, and I think I would keep going back to that more than mm-hmm. West Ho 1. Yeah. Well, West Hill One's already in. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. I like West Hill One. <laughs> I'm saying I want them to get it. Like, yeah. It's not West Ho One. It's yeah. West Ho and West Ho Two. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you're right. All right. Are we ready? Oh, this is going to be exciting. I'm this sorry. is going to be an exciting book. Exciting, exciting, exciting book. Okay. okay. Ready? Ready? One, one, three, three. Okay, so it is not unanimous, but this piece is in. So <laughs> we have more yeses than no. Not I'm unanimous like God. West Ho, but Hi. still good news. All right, and we have one more left uh, by Maureen Seaton. It does not have Ho or West in it. <laughs> does it have Jersey, though? It has French. Oh, no. French. Oh, no. <laughs> it's very place, very place. Um, Erica, I hate Oh, God, you're not going to make me read French. Please don't do it. Oh, okay. Then we're not going to. We no, nope, I was kidding. Kidding. We were asking for <laughs> <laughs> Is it still it's raining? Still raining. <laughs> Is it? Are you okay? <laughs> it's still raining, but I'm not reading French. <laughs> Can you read French? Can you read French? <laughs> I just thought since you are a special guest that we should have had you do one, but I guess I should have thought of that earlier. I <laughs> thought about that. I should have yeah. volunteered to read the coffee talk poem. <laughs> Long Island background. <laughs> and now you've made all the rest of us intimidated. I don't want to read the French either. Anybody? Yeah. Want to read the French? Oh, come on. Just Joe, audio, audio, audio engineer? Well, Joe I, speaks French. I read, I read the poem already, <laughs> and the first line is people who live here speak very little French. So maybe oh, oh, we could say like <laughs> news <laughs> Bola. <laughs> No one says news bola in the well, he's <laughs> Erica, can you do Jersey French? I can definitely do Jersey French. Okay. All right. We love Jersey French. Do you feel bold? Okay. You want me to give it my best Jersey French? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Don't mock me later. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> love in the time of snow poem, Lafayette, Colorado. People who live here speak very little French. Lafayette, New Viola, they sometimes say, although Lafayette, famous hero of two worlds, our world, at Le Monde de Lafayette, never skied much past the bunny slope, and few remember him slipping bourbon in cocoa after snowboarding. In fact, few remember him at all. It's still historical as hell here, a veritable winter love fest, de la revolution, 
hippies and nobles lugging down the Rockies. Bravo, well read. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about mangling the French. Never no, apologize. No, you, did it, you did it with grace and a plum, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one might uh, look around in Lafayette, Colorado, and wonder what's French about it. <laughs> hey, at this place. Um, hmm, Lafayette. I really, I really enjoyed this poem, and I, I mean, maybe it's because I grew up in a military family, but I'm very aware that um, General de Lafayette was the. Um, person who taught the American forces to march during the Revolutionary War and his commitment to American independence was part of why um, we are the country that we are. But also, because he was French, when American soldiers march, they do not goose step. If we had learned to march from von Steuben, <laughs> we would have goose stepped, but we didn't. We learned to march from Lafayette. And so he's he's kind of, you know, this like very prominent figure in the Revolutionary War. And and lots and lots of things are named for him. Um and I, I really enjoyed the poem kind of taking um you know it seriously, right? That like this is named for this French guy, and yet there's really nothing French here. Right. There's just there's just lots of skiing. <laughs> and <laughs> Go for it. I like that it's still historical as hell here, <laughs> even though it's not really. Yeah, the hippies and nobles lugging down the Rockies. Yeah, and look at those. So the poem is um, made of two line stanzas, and it's doing this um, sort of. It's got a quirky pattern of breaking a word. Um, so it's S L I P hyphen line break ping bourbon so slipping is broken right um a veritable winter love fest and so love fest is in jam too right so love hyphen fest mm -hmm. and i and i'm sort of digging right like or lugging right hippies and nobles lug hyphen ing down the rockies like what do you make of that very specific line break breaking the word in the middle um to enjam it like that how, how does that serve lafayette I, I always like that. Um, I mean, the first time I was really aware of anyone breaking, there's an Elizabeth Bishop um, poem where there's a possessive and the apostrophe is on the word on one line and then the S is the start of the next line. Nice, right. And it's just like, it's it's just such a shock. And, and I think with this, I mean, it's not, I, I didn't see, it, it's not um, syllabic. So I don't think mm -hmm. there's like, it's, it's usually a five or six syllable count. I don't think it's, um, it doesn't seem sprung rhythm. I mean, there do seem to be like two to three strong stresses per line, but it's not, you know, kind of um, overwhelming. But I, I really liked it. I thought that it kind of kept the the line really nice. It was very playful. I thought yeah, it, was, yeah. like, yeah. it, it seemed um, to kind of fit with the tongue and cheek tone of the rest of the work. Well, also the double meaning, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say it mimics the action in some ways of skiing or of, um, yeah. Making the, sort of making those carving those turns and skiing sometimes before you're ready to or I don't the, the couplets reminded me of skis themselves oh, oh yeah yeah <laughs> I was just thinking about like the part where it says the bunny slope and few remember him slip like that could mean he slips down the slope but then slipping bourbon and cocoa I really like that mm -hmm. as well the way that you can break up the lines yeah and I love that that means some might remember him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You do, but there are those who do. Because we're historical. <laughs> we're historical. Thing, right? Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Agreed. That's delightful. Really delightful. Love in the time of snow poem is also <laughs> also just great. Yeah. I like that title. Yeah. All right. The love fest. It's a veritable love fest. <laughs> Winter love fest de la revolution. Well, let's see. Let's see. Let's vote. Are we ready? Are you calling it? Yeah, I think we're ready. I think so, okay. if you're all ready. Okay, one, two, three, vote. Une, deux, trois. <laughs> I have to say the... Oh, go, go, oh, go, go, oh go. no! Oh, there's a retraction. Hold it, hold no, there's it. No, there's no retraction. What do you oh, want to say? I was going to say... I do <laughs> like this one, but I've maxed out at the play stuff yes, here. Yes. I've hit my limit. I like it, and I I would not have liked it if it was another West Hill. Uh-huh. But I maxed out on the Colorado. I like the ski, the ski sarcasm 
<laughs> and the digs at the hippies. But I'm maxed but out. But you're done. Okay, you're done. Yeah. You're done. Okay, <laughs> man. But, but that final commentary does not affect the fact right. that the vote came in as a unanimous yes. And you know, I really have to say this, Mary. I am so proud of myself for not bringing up the fact that Lafayette was your New Orleans nickname. Oh. oh. I'm so proud of myself for not bringing that up. <laughs> so. That is a recollection of that. How long ago was that? Many moons. Many moons. It, it was, feels like yesterday. Many, many feels like yesterday. <laughs> I'm still there. Part of me is still there. Yep. Drinking a Bloody Mary with a string bean in it. Um, but, but I digress. Uh, <laughs> this was wonderful. So we were three for three with Maureen Seaton and all for our locals issue. And I'm so grateful for Erica joining us today. Thank you, Thanks for having me. Yay. Enjoy your rain. Thanks. <laughs> some brandy and some cocoa. <laughs> yeah. And shellax. That'll definitely make the RNC poems a little bit easier to write. <laughs> yeah. So send us that link. And um, listeners, remember that you can go look at those poems at pbq.drexel.edu. You can comment on these podcasts on our Facebook event pages that correspond to each episode. You can send us a self-dressed stamped envelope and we will mail you a fun sticker for your laptop or whatever device you use. It would even fit on a cell phone, really, about the size, I think. And um, visit the website, poke around, send us notes, keep reading. Bye. 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 Bye.